Hello, everybody. Yes. Sorry to interrupt your... Can you hear me? Lovely conversations there. Um, it's my job and my absolute pleasure to welcome you tonight to the climate outreach uh, book launch of our book, Talking Climate. Um, if there's any way that we can help you, please approach somebody with a, a yellow badge, uh, orange badge, saying climate outreach. Um, my name's Tani Alexander. I'm the uh, climate outreach's fundraiser. Um, we're really excited at the number of people who've registered for the, for the event and uh, want to make sure that you feel very warmly welcome. Um, and just before we start uh, the formal program, I wondered uh, whether I could ask who is from Oxford, if you don't mind putting your hands up. Wow, most people are from Oxford. Anybody from outside Oxford this evening? Wow. How, um, who, who thinks they might have come the furthest? <laughs> Okay. Any advance on Bristol via London? <laughs> no? Good. Well, local events are brilliant events, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I would just like to introduce um, tonight's speakers, who are Jamie Clark, uh, followed by Adam, Adam Corner. Sorry, I keep taking the mic away from my mouth. The format of the program this e evening will be Jamie will do a short warm-up, um, and Adam will then uh, give the main speech of the evening, which um, I read and I was absolutely riveted by, so I hope you will be too. Following that, we'll do our normal climate outreach thing of um, asking you to break into groups and discuss whatever uh, comes to mind after what you've heard. And then there'll be a little time for questions and answers. And that'll be the end to the formal program, after which you'll be invited to go next door um, and have a complimentary drink in the Crisis Cafe next door. So here's Jamie Clark, the Executive Director of Climate Outreach. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, and thanks for coming along. Lots of faces I recognise, but lots of news people as well. Um, when Adam and I were writing this book, when we started last Christmas, um, Brexit hadn't happened, Trump hadn't been elected, it was a different world. And now the world we find ourselves with a soon-to-be President of the United States who's continually denied the existence of climate change, we're in a country where the UK's environmental leg legislation and policies could potentially all be under threat. It feels like this is a world where learning how to more effectively engage and articulate the importance of climate change is a bit of a no-brainer now. And thank you for coming along to talk about it. And I think the book really feels like it's, it's at the right time. But even before these seismic political shifts, Adam and I thought this was a really important and vital book to write. We have seen some amazing progress recently on climate change, um, to be fair. We, the Paris Accord last year showed that there could be and possibly is international willingness to actually push at a policy level for 1.5 degrees that a lot of us never thought we'd see. So that's great. Low carbon technology is moving ahead in, in leaps and bounds. The cost of renewable energy is tumbling. We're seeing finance and business come on board at long last. And there's a sense, there's a palpable sense of, from my perspective and maybe from yours that climate change um, is now an issue that activists are feeling re-energized about. So all very positive. But I'm adamant that and if all this progress that we've made is going to achieve what it should do, then we need to get widespread, public, ongoing support for tackling climate change. And we live in a society, and, and we've seen it um, in the elections, of climate silence, almost. Where in the UK and the US, you can have an election where the biggest threat to our planet isn't even talked about. It's shocking. When there's a, such an important issue as this, so urgent, addressing this silence has got to be vital. And it's not just at the political level. Um, understandably, many of us in the climate change community previously haven't prioritized the communication to other people. 
we've been having to advocate for policy changes, defend policies and laws. We've had to focus on infrastructure and other really important tangible efforts to create the low-carbon society, low society we really want. But all that could be undermined if we don't have that widespread public support. And it's, it's understandable, but it's also very difficult why people don't talk about climate change. It's surprisingly hard. Um, a, a fear of feeling like this might be a school session, but my kids are here, so that's OK. Um, I'd just like to get a sense from the audience. Over this festive period, you may well be having nice dinners. Do you think you'd feel comfortable? Who would feel comfortable raising the issue of climate change with their friends around the dinner table? Ooh, pretty much unanimous. Not everyone. Okay. All right. Keep your hand up if you'd feel the same about relatives. You know, those relatives you haven't seen for ages who come around at uh, Christmas time. Possibly. Quite a lot of you still being very comfortable talking about climate change. Okay. What about the festive period when you're maybe traveling on buses in a public place? You, would you talk to a stranger and feel comfortable without talking about climate change? Let's see. Okay. A lot less. Not surprisingly, possibly. Um, which I think is indicative, isn't it, of the, the difficulty in which even those of us who give up our Friday nights to come to a climate change event can find it difficult to talk about the issue that we care about so passionately. And if we need to transform society, transform the infrastructure of society, the laws of society, the behaviour of people in society, we think getting the majority of society on board is fundamental. And that is really difficult. Or as Naomi Klein said it, if we want to change everything, it takes everyone. And that's the centre of the climate outreach mission. For over 10 years, we've been focused on trying to engage non-environmentalists, bringing in understanding of how to connect to people who don't normally get this issue, turning it into practical tools, resources, and projects to engage people of faith, people on the center right, young people, migrants, refugees groups, people who aren't the new normal subjects. And when there's a virtual social or political silence, having a conversation, discussion, is more than words. It's actually quite a considerable act for a lot of us and a lot of people out there. And the book that we created was designed to help engage with that act, to help you engage and others. Anyone who wanted to get tips and understanding of how to engage uh, people on climate change, we designed this book for you. It's a, it's a complex and often difficult issue to address, but we've designed this book to try and provide the practical answers, to take five principles to turn climate change from an issue that sits on the, the margins of the cultural and societal uh, edges of our, our, our world and turn it into the mainstream. So that's why we were motivated to do this. I'm now going to hand over to Adam to talk about actually what's in the book. Great, okay, thank you very much. And just to, just to echo Jamie and Tani, it's really great to see so many people here this evening, so, so thanks for joining us. So, so when, when climate change first, first made the leap from the pages of, of scientific journals um, into the, the, the public and the political arena back in the early 1980s, I think there was an, there was an assumption, uh, a, a hope that the, the facts of climate science, the growing body of evidence of how we're influencing the climate would be enough, would be shocking, would be serious, would be significant enough to galvanize a societal response. And there was a, a, a convenient political model around to copy. So the Montreal Protocol to regulate CFCs out of the system to fix the hole in the ozone layer. But as we now know, through bitter experience, although that agreement was brought about relatively painlessly, relatively quickly, the, a comparable political agreement on climate change took 21 long years. And I guess in hindsight, the analogy between these two issues is, is maybe not so strong. The ozone problem could be, could be solved essentially without any ongoing public engagement in a fairly technocratic way. Um, one of the central arguments of our book is that climate change absolutely cannot 
politicians are not going to run ahead of where public opinion is. Um, technologies are not going to be built or they're not going to be used if they don't have a social license. And as we've seen from the events of this year already, all of our policies and progress uh, remain fragile and delicate if, if they're not grounded in a, in a robust foundation of public engagement. So, so campaigners acknowledging that that the facts weren't going to speak for themselves, I guess, showed, showed images of, of melting ice caps and polar bears, of burning globes, very much in the hope that they would, they would shock and scare people into action. And for sure, they, they, they tug on our heartstrings and they've spoken to a certain group of people, of, of maybe people who already consider themselves to be environmentalists or conservationists. Um, but as well as that, they've helped inadvertently to, to craft a visual identity for climate change that is distant and detached from, from most people's lives. We now know from, from research that the, the visual vocabulary of climate change has, has inadvertently trapped the, the cultural meaning of the issue in a, in a kind of narrow niche. Most people just don't identify with what they perceive as a, as a stereotypical environmentalist, unfortunately. And so the fact that climate change is an environmentalist issue or is so strongly tagged as this is a real communications challenge. Most people also don't experience uh, you know, the, the, the terrifying climate impact, impacts of climate change on a daily basis, or they, or they don't in, the, in countries such as ours anyway. And so because of this, again, recognizing that the facts are not enough, campaigners tried to, to kind of generate, create a sense of fear through the now infamous doom and gloom environmentalist messaging through apocalyptic um, slogans and phrases. And of course, there is absolutely very much to fear from climate change. But again, research shows that although fear can be a good motivator to change people's behavior, it only works under certain conditions, um, the, the, the threat the, the risk that you're talking to people about has to be quite personal and direct. So what might work for something like anti-smoking campaigns, it might even work for HIV campaigning, doesn't necessarily work for climate change campaigning. And that, of course, doesn't mean that we can't learn lessons um, from previous social change issues. And, and the second chapter of our book is, is, is focused on exactly that question. What can we learn from, from previous social change campaigns? One of the clear lessons seems to be that where things have been successful and have managed to have traction over time, then there's been ongoing peer-to-peer -peer engagement. But most climate campaigns have tended to be structured around kind of key moments, particular political asks, and then the wider public engagement has tended to drift away. Interest has drifted off after that. And, and partly as a consequence of that, partly as a consequence of, of many other things, Public engagement is still stuck in second gear in a country like ours. So the first, the first principle in our book is that we should be learning lessons from previous social change issues. Um, what can we learn? What can we map over to climate change campaigning? But we also need to be realistic about the, the, the many myriad of ways in which climate change seems to be different, frustratingly different. So sometimes our intuitions and our instincts about climate change campaigning are right, but sometimes they're not. So that means that we have to be prepared to test our assumptions, test our materials for engaging the public. That's, that's the first place to start. So as, as Jamie said, the, the political ground uh, moved under our feet somewhat as we were writing this book. And I think it's fair to say that you know, the Trump and the Brexit campaigns discourses were so viscerally grounded in disputes between values um, at the ex expense often of, of rational debate about the facts. We saw that, you know, elite knowledge was, was dismissed, derided, the tone became nasty, and the focus was on, on threats to particular core values, so things like security, freedom, and control. And and the term post-truth has been used a lot to describe the, the, the situation we find ourselves in in 2016. And I, it, gives, it gives me no pleasure whatsoever to say that none of this is alien or unfamiliar to those of us who, who, who have been watching and learning and following the climate discourse for many years. And you could argue that climate change has been in that post-truth space in terms of campaigning for a long time, fighting against skeptic arguments that have been fairly untethered from the facts. 
But just as experts war lined up to, to warn us about the dangers of Brexit, climate scientists have lined up to tell us about the, the consensus on climate change. And in both cases, it hasn't swayed public opinion in the way that we would expect it to. Um, whereas sceptical arguments, like the, the Trump and Brexit campaigns, have focused on almost identical values, you know, freedom, control, security, and the threat to those values that they say climate policies would bring, unreliable energy supplies, um, restrictions on, on businesses and behaviour. So for, for understanding Brexit, for understanding Trump, and definitely for understanding climate change engagement, values are absolutely key. And that's, you know, that's something that, that, that social psychologists have been telling us for, for a long time, not just on climate change. Values are the building blocks on which our attitudes to a whole range of different subjects and topics are based. So if we, if we worry about inequality, then we, we, we apply that, that value, that concern to most situations that we face. If we, if we are worried about um, instability, then we bring that tension with us to all the decisions that we make. And research has shown time and time again that what drives people's views about climate change is not how much they know about climate science, um, any more than people's vote in the EU referendum was about how much they'd interrogated the ins and outs of EU policies. Um, it's driven by their values. And just to emphasize, in case it's not clear, what we're not advocating for is ignoring the facts. Um, there's, no, there's, no, there's no argument for not sticking with the, the science of climate change to guide the campaigns that we create. But we need to be, as well as being factually right, we also need to be persuasive. We need to get better at being both of those things at the same time. <clears throat> so, so climate change campaigning needs to start from people's values um, and work upwards from there, rather than starting with the facts of, of climate science and expecting those to, to catalyze a, a passionate social, cultural response. So, protecting the environment, social justice, living in harmony with nature, they're, they're really crucial, core, important values. They're, they're values that, that I hold dear, um, and I guess they're, they're fairly founding values of the environmental movement. So they're important to campaign around, and lots of climate campaigns have, have used them as the basis for their messages. But you could also argue that, in a sense, they're, they're preaching to the choir in terms of reaching people beyond that environmentalist movement. Other, other campaigns have, have kind of gone in the opposite direction and have said, well, OK, we, we, need, to get, we need to get beyond the usual suspects, so we'll talk about um, things that play into people's sense of, of self-interest. Um, will tell people that they should be green because they can save money. Um, tell them they should, they should save energy because it's good for their, their income, for their wallet. But again, research finds that if you only use those types of values in a message, it doesn't build public engagement with climate change at all. It just encourages the sense that you should only care about this issue um, because it's in your own interest. And when, when climate change so obviously is a collective action problem, then that's not good enough either. So somewhere between these two ends, between, I guess, the, 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 the values that, that already describe the environmentalist worldview and these more sort of self-interested values, is actually quite a lot of scope and uh, potential for telling different types of climate stories. So about clean energy providing a healthier life or about renewable energy offering security and resilience about the exciting possibilities that a low-carbon future can bring, or conversely, about being sensible, preserving, conserving, passing on something to the next generation that's worth fighting for. These are all fertile grounds for climate campaigns that, that, that exist in the middle of those two extremes. So the second principle above the book is that just as for Brexit and as the US election, the building blocks of any effective climate change campaign are people's values. As we collectively began to realize that the, the facts, the scary statistics of climate change weren't going to be enough to galvanize public opinion on their own, then it became increasingly clear we were going to have to talk ourselves into this. We were going to have to construct a meaning, create a meaning for climate change. And a, a, an industry is built up around exactly this idea of, of thinking about words, language, framing messages in different ways um, to try and engage people on climate change. And, it's something that we take very seriously at Climate Outreach. Um, 
making climate change less abstract, more tangible has been a big focus of framing research. So talking about climate related effects like health impacts, like air pollution, very topical at the moment, about avoiding wastefulness in energy use. It, it grounds the idea of climate change and it's much more productive than talking about uncertain global abstract risks or uh, numerical temperature targets that, that people have real difficulty in engaging with. But it's also fair to say, I think, that there, there aren't any magic words. We're not going to suddenly catalyse public engagement by tweaking the odd word here and there in a sentence, especially if those messages are, are delivered by the same people as the old messages were delivered by before. They're unlikely to reach outside of the green bubble in that way. So our, our argument, I guess, is that is that words are essential, language is crucial, it's a, it's, a, it's a central portal for public engagement with climate change. But most framing initiatives haven't gone far enough. So, for example, to engage across the political spectrum, um, to reach those more on the right who have tended to be more resistant to climate policies, more skeptical about climate change. It's a program of work we've, we've spent a lot of time on at Climate Outreach. It isn't enough to just state that climate policies will bring jobs or will lead to green growth. It needs to be more than that. The actual social and cultural meaning of climate change needs to shift or expand so that people on the right see themselves um, in, in the language of climate policies and hear a story that speaks to their, their core values. And our work in this area shows that if you focus on ideas like avoiding wastefulness, restoring balance, locking in resilience and security, there is the potential to reach out across the political spectrum. And none of those ideas, I think, are threatening to, to the left either. Um, but it does mean new stories. And if those stories can be delivered by people who, who share the values of the audience that they're speaking to, then those stories are all the more powerful. So, so words are obviously not enough on their own to keep fossil fuels in the ground, but anecdotes and stories are the currency that most people trade in, not, not the facts of climate science. So the stories we tell about climate change carry those facts, not the other way around. And our third principle reflects this reality. So I've talked about values, about stories, words, and the cultural meaning of climate change, but I haven't said very much about what we actually think people should be doing in response to climate change. And we can hardly talk about public engagement without talking about individual behaviours. I think in the early days of climate campaigning, there was a big a big push for people to make lots of simple changes in their lifestyles. And the logic was, if enough of us make small changes, we can achieve a lot. Um, and at Climate Outreach, and certainly for me personally as well, we, we certainly believe individual actions are, are crucial for those of us who, who, are, who, are, who are lucky enough to have flexibility over the way we spend our time, the way we spend our money. We've got a responsibility to reduce our, our carbon footprints. Um, but there's been... I think a bit of a turn away from the idea of do your bit from climate change campaigners, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. Firstly, despite the, the neatness of the phrase, doing lots of little changes adds up mostly to a little. Um, and secondly, because it's really, really tough to change behaviours. They're socially embedded, um, we're influenced by other people around us, they're often habitual, they're really tricky to change. So one reaction to this has been, I guess, to try and trick people into changing their behaviours without them knowing about it. Uh, you, probably, you probably heard of the term nudge, um, the nudge approach to behaviour change. It was popularised at a political level in the UK by the, the Cameron government, who set up a nudge behavioural insights unit. And the basic logic that is, is if you can make changes in the environment around people, then you can encourage them, nudge them to make better choices, choices in a certain direction. So if you, if you change the default choice that people are presented with, then most people will follow that default. And if you make that default a green energy tariff, then more people will choose that tariff than if, if you'd made the default the, the high carbon alternative. And governments and the private sector like this kind of approach because it seems to offer the prospect of changing behaviours without anything as paternalistic or interfering as a behaviour change campaign. Um, so, so is that is it possible? Is this is this the answer? Can we nudge ourselves uh, towards sustainability, one low carbon behaviour at a time? And I think the answer to that question depends on how you think about people. Whether you think of people as uh, a kind of disconnected bundle of behaviours that you can pick out one at a time, or whether you have a more holistic view of 
human nature. What, what is it that holds the dozens of behaviours, attitudes, actions that comprise a low-carbon lifestyle together? Our answer to that would be its values, its identities, which make people who they are, and, and control and influence how we respond in a whole range of different situations. So skipping that part, going straight for the nudges without engaging at that level of identity, at level of values, seems like maybe a false economy. Nudge, nudge is ultimately an, an unthinking approach to behaviour change. That's the point of it. You're not supposed to think about it. Um, when, in fact, precisely the opposite is required. We need to see a conscious process of reflection on the, the complex challenge of a societal response to climate change. We can't do this without thinking about it. So our fourth principle is that we need to move from this nudge idea to something else. And if we had to give it one word, we'd give it the one word, think as a strategy for changing behaviours. That means cultivating a sense of citizenship around climate change, where people have a sense of the bigger picture on climate change and their place in it. So I think, well, as, as, as Jamie's experiment at the start of today showed, beyond the, the, the green bubble, climate conversations are, are pretty few and far between, and, and that, that does have consequences. We, 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 we don't understand what what other people, we have no good sense of what other people think about climate change. There was a recent survey which asked people about their support for, for onshore wind. As ever, it finds high support, lots of people favourable towards it. That same survey asked people to estimate what proportion of the population they thought agreed with that view, and people drastically underestimated the level of support out there for renewable technologies. So that's at least in part caused by this kind of conversational vacuum around climate change. We literally don't know what other people think about this crucial issue, and that, that has consequences. Um, if you think about something like drink driving, the fact that we know what other people think about it and we know that there's a negative stereotype is a, is a huge influence on other people's behaviour. Plus, as Jamie was alluding to, politicians need support to enact the low carbon policies that they, they, they've written into law. And that, that doesn't, it does mean lobbying MPs, but it means much more than that as well. It means building a, a, a chorus of voices in support of, of, of climate policies. And that means getting ordinary people talking about climate change. As, as Jamie said, it, quite a radical act when faced with the social silence around this issue. What does it mean? What does climate change mean for my life, who I am, the people around me? This is something that one government is taking seriously. We were asked by the Scottish government to um, develop and test a, a model for, for, for holding climate conversations at a national level in Scotland to help them build support for the policies that they have. They've, they've realised and acknowledge they're not going to reach those ambitious goals unless they have the support of the public to do so. And when you think about it, it makes complete sense. They, governments invest billions in physical infrastructure for energy projects, but almost nothing in the social infrastructure, the people that are underneath them that are going to use them, that engage with them, that will use them or not. So that kind of investment in talking climate in a social infrastructure, like any investment will pay off over time. It means any individual campaign, initiative, communication strategy, it's sat on a higher, a higher baseline of engagement amongst people because it doesn't come out of the blue when campaigns do occur. So this obviously means getting outside of the normal channels. It means getting outside of, 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 of the green bubble. And, and it means trying to hand and expand some ownership of climate change into sort of powerful pre-existing networks wherever they are, where climate change can come to life and it, and it is, doesn't have to be socially and culturally owned by a narrow group of the population, which it, it still is to, to a large extent. And lots of our work at Climate Outreach has been about doing, trying to do exactly that, um, trying to catalyze new voices. We've worked with faith groups, and we've been, we've been uh, fascinated to see that, that different social groups can bring quite different perspectives, different language, different narratives to bear on the same problem, can inject new life into the issue. And it's obviously not just faith groups. We need to hear more from Mark Carney talking up stranded assets and carbon bu bubbles. We need to hear more from the National Farmers Union who can locate climate change on our plates and in our fields. Um, we need to hear more from the Women's Institute, from Premier League football supporters clubs, the places where people gather and interact and exchange their views and spend their time. That kind of interaction by trusted 
communicators with each other is probably worth 100 professional climate change campaigners. And, and, and culture can turbocharge the stories that we tell on climate change, but there's been such limited cultural engagement with climate change beyond the green bubble that that potential is, is almost entirely untapped. So our fifth and last principle in the book <coughs> has to do with reaching beyond the usual suspects. As Jamie said, it isn't easy to, to, to strike up conversations about climate change. It can feel daunting, it can feel awkward and complex, um, even though it's relevant to almost every aspect of our lives, so there's no shortage of connections to make. But the longer we wait to initiate a meaningful conversation about climate change, then the harder it will be. So we need new voices to reach beyond the usual suspects. That's the fifth principle in our book. So we need to start talking climate. And that could mean a national conversation such as the one in Scotland. It could mean people who know each other, share something in common, live near each other, have some shared interest talking to each other. But one thing's for sure isn't going to happen on its own. Climate change isn't like other risks and threats. It isn't like an earthquake where we, we, we know what we have to do. It's obvious what we have to do. We, want, we need to run away. It isn't like terrorism where there's some obvious bad guys, some people to fear. To, 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 and to respond to. We have to create and construct a meaning or meanings of climate change um, before we can consistently act on it. And that's exactly the problem. For many people, there, there isn't that, that, that meaning, that social, cultural meaning for climate change. And so why would they be acting on it? In the short term, that is obviously going to lead to a certain amount of dispute and disagreement. If we're, if we're advocating for developing new, authentic stories and narratives about what climate change means, how to tackle it, that are beyond the groups that have engaged with it so far, then they're not all going to be the same. Um, one thing that climate change won't bring is, is smoothing over of, of our political differences, that's for sure. But, but isn't it better to be, to be passionately disagreeing about the roots between here and a sustainable future than to be talking to ourselves while most people carry on as usual. I think with, with, with individual behaviours in particular, we've, 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 seen, we've tried to run, I think, before we can walk. Um, a small handful of people, including I'm sure lots of you in the room, um, got it because they, they really thought about it and what it meant and, and how it impacted on their lives and how they should respond to it. But the vast majority of people were told, here's 10 simple things you can do without thinking about it too much. And as a result, people haven't thought about it too much and it's just too easy to let it slip down our priority list. So any, any forum that lets us talk about climate change, speak to other people we know, respect, are interested in, is really, really valuable. Um, it's just there's not many of them around. Um, we've developed one method, which we call our narrative workshop method, uh, where we talk to people about who they are, their values, their, their sense of priorities in life, their hopes for the future. And we use that as a, a platform to introduce the idea of climate change and what it means for different people's lives. And, and We've done this with faith communities, with trade unions, with political conservatives, with young people. And it, it, it seems to work in the sense that when people sit down with other people they know or can engage with, can identify with, and talk about climate change, um, it, it builds a sense of the importance of the issue that, that no behavior change program can do, no nudge can do, um, which is cultivating a sense of, of citizenship and responsibility and ownership around climate change that at the moment is, is, still, is still confined to a fairly narrow group of the population. So we, we surely, of course, don't have much time. And I think that's why there's been a hesitation to want to engage or to approach public engagement in this way. We've tended to think instead, let's go for the, the quick wins, the nudges that can demonstrate um, immediately that things are happening. But our argument would be that whether it's behavioural changes, energy policies, none of them are going to last or have longevity um, without robust, resilient public support. Um, so it, we don't gain time against the ticking clock by ignoring this kind of public engagement. Um, it's, the, it's the glue that holds all the different aspects of a response to climate change together. So it's a false economy to say we haven't got time to be talking to each other, constructing a really powerful sense of what this issue means and, and how we're going to deal with it together as a society. So, we need to learn from the past, previous social change campaigns. We need to test our assumptions because our intuitions aren't always right. We need to try and foster a sense of climate citizenship rather than little nudges to behaviours. 
We need to start with values, tell powerful new stories, and to achieve all of this, I guess, especially in the current political context and world that we find ourselves in, we need to start talking climate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Adam, um, and I'm sure that people will have questions, but first I'd like you to, if you would enjoy to do this, to get into small groups with people round about you and to talk about what you've heard, maybe go through some of the challenges and questions that you have for a few minutes. Thank you. Back together again, please. Thank you. <laughs> right, folks, we've got um, Adam and Jamie here, desperate to take your questions. Um, thank you. I'll, I'll take some questions, maybe two or three at a time, or comments. Uh, can I start at the side of the room? Anybody got a question or a comment? I was particularly fascinated. I was particularly interested by your uh, efforts to uh, talk to the right uh, politically, um, and I just wondered whether NLP um, played a part in any of your sort of ideas about how you communicate with, with that constituency. Great question, thank you. Anything else from this side of the room? Um, hi, I'm from an organisation um, which focuses on youth um, engagement with climate change. Um, I was asking, I was wondering if uh, we could talk a little bit about the role of youth in um, communicating climate change because it's very interesting to me. Great, thank you. Another one from over this side of the room? No? There's somebody at the back, I think that's Chris. Maybe Ashley, sorry, I should have said, could you say who you are as well? <laughs> that would be good. Hey, uh, Chris Church, um, as you say. Um, I couldn't help noticing Adam used the word climate campaigns and climate campaigners seven or eight times in talking about your own work. Uh, this seems to me it puts you very firmly in the middle of the green bubble. And that when it was, the word campaigner is hugely loaded. And I do some work with Sheila McKechnie Foundation that supports local campaigners. And one of the things we realise is how far campaigner, busybody, activist, curtain twitcher turns people off. Perhaps we should think quite carefully about how we use this phrase. Great, thank you. That's the first three. Adam, Jamie. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe to start with the, the the last one, the most recent one. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. There is there is all sorts of stigma around that phrase, and we found exactly the same thing in terms of visual imagery as well. So, um, what one of our projects over the last year has been exploring how people respond to images of climate change, and one of the most surprising findings um, was the the level of uh, criticism that was that was um, aimed at images of, of, of kind of stereotypical climate protesters and I'm certainly not saying it's justified um, I've you know like many people in the room have been on demonstrations e exactly like it um, but the feeling was that people were um, not kind of authentic and credible they were they were hypocritical they were telling other people how to change their behaviors when they maybe were flying off a, a, abroad themselves now whether or not that that is justified is maybe is not really the the point i think the point is protests and demonstrations are essentially mostly performances for other people to watch they sometimes are aimed at particular particular practical aims but they're often aimed at uh, making a performance for the outside world the media or whoever it will be and so we have to ask how are those performances being received who's watching them what do they take from them um so I mean, I, I I very much very much agree with the sentiment of of taking a, a critical perspective on what the word campaigner means, what the the idea of of a campaigner is visually, um, and I think that's a challenge for that's a challenge for all of us. You don't what we don't want to do is 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 pour pour cold water on the energy that drives um, activism of any kind. Um, but we also need to be kind of crit self-critical, I think, about it. And I guess that's 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 the role we probably see ourselves as having often. Do you want to do the NLP one? Okay. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, um, I think it is true. Um, but uh, throughout the book, I suppose we're, we're saying, have the right discussion with the right people. And uh, 
knowing the people, most of the people in the room, campaigners doesn't tend to be that much of a problem for this audience. But it, but it is, it's really important to think in this way. I mean, actually in chapter two of the book, we had the most controversial discussions, I think, about direct action and the role of campaigners within, um, who take direct action. And, and for some people who are in our world of comms experts, they feel like that causes a problem because it, it creates this image of these campaigners and, and people get turned off by that. But actually we say we need that a, a chorus of different voices. In most social uh, struggles that have been successful, you have had the campaigners involved and they have created the space in which other conversations happen where faith leaders move in, where business people move in, they, but, and they've often been at the front of that. The problem I think we identified and discussing here is that often people only see that as the voice of climate change, and we just need to widen that, that group. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then I was going to come back on the youth discussion, which is a um, particular um, passion of mine, I suppose. Um, I, I'm actually sitting here largely because of my work with young people um, through um, an organisation called People and Planet, um, who are based in Oxford. And, and through that process, I, I realised um, that we had a problem. I would go into six forms, into, into colleges, and talk about the issue of climate change with young people. Um, and I'd put up pictures of graphs and talk about polar bears and ask people to stop flying. And, um, and I usually would get a group of young people by the end who are very keen to do exactly what I'd suggested that we campaign on. But I stood back and I realized after a couple of years that those young people were pretty much the same young people as me in terms of values, perspectives uh, on the world. And, and that's where I, I came across Adam's work on Climate Outreach's work on, on how you uh, widen engagement. And it is quite different. Young people have grown up with this issue. It is in their curriculum, just. Um, and it, for some, it's taught in a way that's like um, Pythagoras' theorem. It's, it's not a new thing, it's not a big threat, it's not personal, it's actually from the books of academia. So we need to create a different conversation and it needs to work and the, the really good thing about young people is in all our research, they're nowhere, the skeptics don't really exist for them, no matter where their values are, whether they're right or left influences, skeptics aren't a big issue um, for them. But it is a different way of talking and a bit different way of discussing. And the, my anecdotal experience, we haven't proven this yet, is um, when I talk to young people, they'll often come out with discussions about acid rain and the ozone layer and in connection with climate change. And that's because their teachers were brought up with that issue and they've then translated it into a conversation and the young people have taken that on board and it leads to a very confused discussion. So I think there's a lot of work needed for, for young people. And just the, the, the final point then on the, on the, on the centre-right work. Um, I guess it's a, it's a slightly, it always feels like a slightly um, funny, funny, funny topic for, for many of us within the organisation perhaps, um, in that it, 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 it's certainly not the case that, that we, 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 we selected kind of centre-right engagement as something to necessarily reflect our own personal values, but very much as a practical research-led intervention into a into a problem that we saw which was w what do we do with this fact that there is political polarization do we just kind of shout louder with the facts or, or do we try and find a creative evidence-based way to respond to that that's that's the kind of philosophy underpinning it and um uh, you know we've we, we've we've tested various different ideas and themes and and, and language and, and narratives one of the one of the concepts that seems to be quite Productive in terms of starting a, a well a, a better conversation on the centre right is is the idea of kind of avoiding wastefulness in energy use as a as a core principle. It's common sense. It's practical. Um, it's it has to do with with conservation, conserving conservatism. Um, and interestingly, and that gives you know that it's a positive thing. We've 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 tested that across the political spectrum as well. So it's developed for people more on on the right to start a conversation. But we have tested it with people who are on the left as well um, in, in, in an online experiment and that language seemed to be favoured by people across the political spectrum so it wasn't the case that, that it's, it's gone off down an, an avenue where then you've, you've, you've shut off the other side of, um, of, the, of the political spectrum as well so 
it's about finding that that common ground, I guess, um, with those 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 core values that that hopefully can have a bit of cross political um, engagement. And the NLP side. Yeah, I don't think that was anything to 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 to, to do with our approach, no. <laughs> In brief. Thank you. Um, next lot of questions from, from the middle group here, please. Um, gentleman with the uh, orange logo in the T-shirt. Hi. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, Chris Philpott, author of a book on green spirituality. So I'm quite interested in the spiritual dimension of this. I wondered how, to me, part of the problem is moral bankruptcy and selfishness that the capitalist system has engendered over generations so that people don't want to do something that might be inconvenient. I'm wondering how much success you've had with faith groups. Um, I'd be interested, you, you mentioned that you had worked with them, um, you know, in terms of, um, so for, for instance, the work of eco-congregations where they've um, looked at energy efficiency in churches and things like that. I wonder whether you could just give me a little inkling of some of the research that you've had there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another one, please. Could you say who you are, if you don't mind? Um, David Newman, Oxfordshire Green Party. I'm interested in, you talk about moving from nudge to getting people to think about climate change, and you mentioned the narrative workshop method. I was wondering how you're going to scale that up to thousands or tens of thousands of people. I actually got involved with citizen engagement back in 94 when we put on the web a system in Northern Ireland that got people who hated each other to find consensus. And there's actually been a long lot of work on uh, citizenship and getting people engaged online in larger numbers and face to face, but still small numbers in the end. So I was wondering, since getting people to talk in small groups actually does change opinions, rather like, or even one-to-one -one in deep canvassing in the States, I was wondering if you thought of any ways to actually do it, lots and lots of them on a large scale. Great question, thank you. Um. Hi, um, I'm Martin Steiner, I'm a teacher, that's why I was nodding so vigorously about that bloody ozone thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I kind of wonder uh, about the distinction between wanting more people to be positive about climate action, so, you know, I don't want to um, waste and things, and having them not feel negatively about it, and whether we're aiming to make people more want things done or to not not want them to be done. I'm even confusing myself here. Um, and whether that affects, whether we would do things differently based on that. Great. Was that really unclear? Thank you very much. Um, it would be good if we could have a woman, maybe. <laughs> Hi, I'm Julie. Um, the question I was thinking, it was actually something you alluded to in your introduction about post-truth. And it's that the current media, both and social media and the printed, seems to be wanting to move people to, the big phrase is, distrust the experts. How do we begin to get this message across if everything else says, distrust the experts? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll let um, give Jamie and Adam a chance to answer those. OK, yeah, thank you. Good, good questions. Um, uh, maybe on the, on the sort of p between positive and, and, and negative question, I, I, I think we sometimes describe our, our approach in here as, you know, somewhere between the, the, the older, uh, more kind of doom and gloom, old style environmental messaging, which I think people rightly, you know, critiqued and thought about and thought, okay, that's not the best way to get, to get ongoing engagement. It then, for some people, flipped into some, somewhere at the other end of the, of the scale, what sometimes has been called like bright siding. Everything's going to be great in the low carbon future, you know. Um, and I think, you know, both of those, both of those have, have problems. And actually, there's quite a lot of space in between where I think it is about positivity, but positivity as in being constructive, not positivity as in thinking that everything's going to be wonderful. Um, and that's that's a more authentic kind of positivity, I think. Um, on scaling up, scaling up um, citizen engagement, which is really 
a crucial question, I think, and it's something that applies to you know any any topic, whatever it is. There's a richness in one-to-one -one conversations or group conversations that is empowering and sort of transformative in many ways. Uh, how, how do you how do you translate that to lots of people at once? Um, I mean, I think I think you. You, you can just do more of it, but you can also couple couple it with with other sort of forums that are maybe not quite so time and energy intensive, but still have elements of the design, I guess, um, the underlying principles of getting people together in social networks, which obviously don't just happen person to person anymore. Very much happen online. You can you can you can to some extent circumnavigate some of that. Um, but I also think maybe it's it's not about every single person. It's about getting to a bit more of a critical mass, you know, where it's not quite so hanging by a thread on only a minority of people who have really thought about this. I think there's there's all sorts of possibilities open up when you when you when you start to move into a position where you've got m many more people engaged with this. Never mind sort of everyone. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll talk about the faith work that we've been doing. So I suppose. This moral vacuum phrase seems to exist quite a lot, but from our work and with different groups, actually, people just have different morals, but they, they do tend to have a compass. And uh, our focus um, with the faith work was clearly around morals and came out very strongly. Um, and it was essentially quite a simple process of allowing groups of people who had that strong moral compass um, which looked similar or felt similar to them to see how climate change fitted with that rather than what's normally happened is there's a there's a set of morals um, that go with climate change that have to be squidged into to your your view of the world and and so it's starting the other way around so we work with uh, we did work with the five five main, the most popular faiths um, and looked at how that could work. Um, that work fed into the, the Pope's encyclical, but also to some statements that came out from imams around Paris, and, and we're working with other communities as well to see how we can empower the leaders to, see, to make positive statements, to start new um, discussions. But it is the same issue, is how do you get the resources and capacity when there's so many other things to do um, to, to keep those conversations going and support them. But there are already some really strong activities going on um, from groups um, through uh, Christian Aid, through Tear Fund for, the, for Christian groups, but other smaller, um, other faiths work that need to be supported and, and supported for their morals, not necessarily just for our morals, which is, it was a quite an enlightenment process. And also, the similar phrase of, of, of self-interest seems to come back in, into this discussion and wider ones of you know, everyone's just interested in their self. And, and of course, when um, you're in an economic climate as we are, when people are struggling to get by, they will prioritise themselves. But repeatedly when we've sat through and had these discussions with trade unionists, com community representatives, different people, actually after that discussion, it becomes quite a communal focus. And... Um, trying to take the positive out of recent political um, d uh, seismic shifts that we've seen. A lot of the discourse um, that led to Brexit, that led to Trump, wasn't just about self-interest for an individual. It was about group identity wanting to be represented. It wasn't I, what's in it for me, it's, it's what's in it for a group of people. So we just have to look at that quite carefully. Um, yeah, I mean, one one thing that was interesting from our from our work that we've done so far with with faith groups was that there was some some concepts and some types of language seemed to have resonance across different faith groups. So the idea of of waking up um, to to climate change, the idea of restoring balance, was was, was something that came up quite quite naturally across the different different faith groups that we worked with. Um, just on the final point about distrusting experts. Um, it's a yeah, it's a it's it's a tricky situation to try and try and puzzle ourselves out of. I think, but I would say that that uh, it goes back to this idea about people actually supporting renewable energies and wind turbines and being engaged with climate change, but not realizing that others are. So that there's, there's a social consensus out there as well as a scientific consensus, an expert consensus, and I think the value of that social consensus has not in any way been fully explored yet. We could do a, a huge amount to promote that. And that's really powerful, and that you know that doesn't seem to fall down the rabbit hole of 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 dismissing expertise and experts, which is 
you know, fla flavor of the month at the moment, but I, I, I guess probably won't last forever. Great, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for one last batch of questions, and I see somebody in the back row is desperate to ask a question. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Well done, thank you very much. Um, I'm Sophia Tickell. Um, and my question is about is partly building on what, what the question just about post-truth, otherwise known as lies, um, <laughs> which is it's really about that there seems to be a sort of underlying assumption in the, what you're saying, which is that there is something that information that we hold that we need to communicate to others, and that's the, what the communication challenge is. And yet some of the analysis about what's happening now is that actually we should be doing a lot more listening and engaging and actually understanding why people hold the views that they hold. So my question to you is, did you do any work? Is there some thinking to be done about engaging with people who are dismissing climate change, who feel that they're, it's not something that they are convinced by? Is there, isn't that part of the communications challenge? And if so, um, how do we do that in this very, very challenging post kind of populist environment? Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you. Um, person in the middle here, please. <laughs> um, hello, my name is Jake Backus um, from Empathy Sustainability, which I called it that because it's really necessary to anchor our arguments on other people's frames of reference, not impose my values on somebody else. Um, uh, we're all waiting for somebody else to solve climate change, notwithstanding we're all complicit as well. Um, and the government doesn't act decisively because they don't have a mandate from voters, as you already mentioned. Businesses would be greener tomorrow if consumers and shoppers only demanded more. So notwithstanding, we're all hoping people will change their behaviours and they feel their small actions won't make any difference, although I feel small actions are going to make all the difference because we only have small actions. But the one action which they can take, which doesn't even need them to change their behaviour in some respects, is just to demand more. So demand more of government and demand more of business. And businesses, are so they have to listen to consumers and customers or their business is dead. So how do we just get people to demand more? Good point. Thank you. Um, somebody upstairs who's going to have to shout, yeah. unless Lydia can fly with the microphone. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one last question from this side of the room. Uh, Pete. I'm just reflecting sadly that 10 years ago we were all excitedly learning about Obama's campaign, what we could learn from it. Um, and you talked about values and identity, which were central, as you said, to both the Brexit campaigns and the Trump campaign. So what can we learn from them? They're very successful politicians and campaigners even if we don't like the word campaigner. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm afraid um, that's probably all we've got time for at the moment. So I think we'll try and do our best to, to, to touch on as much as we can of, of, of that, some, some, some big ones in there. Um, on the, so in terms of engaging with people who are, who are skeptical or who are not persuaded or who, who don't in, engage with, with climate change currently, I think that's exactly what our center right work for example is, is is about and and i guess exactly the approach is to try and is to try and listen to people first and foremost so we didn't we we didn't kind of come up with um words and language that that that, that we thought was 
um, good. We asked people who were who were who were of that political um, persuasion and, and and talked to them about how they felt and spoke about the issue. And I think that's generally the approach that we're we're advocating. Um, what did they think? So there's a re there's a resistance to what a lot of people see as exaggeration and 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 hyperbole around climate change and renewable energy targets. It's not so much the the issues themselves, but the the way that I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, so not not my not, not my uh, opinions, but the way that they're kind of presented and dressed up, um, and. You know that's difficult because climate change is is probably more urgent than it than it's give, generally given credit for. But yet we're we're stuck in that paradox where people feel that if you if you give it that level of urgency and that level of um, emergency feel about it, people rail against it because you can't touch it and, and and feel it and smell it in front of you like like other risks. So so it's 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 a kind of a catch twenty two. But you have to go with the you have to go with the grain to some extent of where people are on this, which doesn't mean moving the goalposts on where we need to get to. But I think it does mean starting from a whole variety of different starting points, um, including those who are who are who are, who, are, who are not currently engaged at all. Um, I don't know whether there's a there's a, I guess there's a category of of people as there is on any issue um who seem so far away from where where we are or where the mainstream is that it's difficult to know where to start that conversation but I think there's a huge swathe of of people who who it's not it's not that they are uh, ve vehemently opposed to climate change they just haven't haven't engaged with what it means yet for for their lives where they're going what they think the future should hold how they want the future to be um and yeah I would say that's pretty fundamental to to most of our work, really. Yeah, we're trying to summarise. Um, I think maybe we haven't emphasised enough that largely our approach is to start with listening, and that's often felt quite difficult because we, it's urgent, it's important, we know the solutions. Why isn't anyone taking this on board? But actually, the importance of listening has really come across in, in the work um, when we focused on the centre-right, which are the majority in this country and across Europe, so it's, there's a really good strategic reason to do it. But also, I sat in very interesting work groups with hundreds of, of different people from different political, trade union backgrounds, and often you close your eyes, and actually the concerns and also passions of people are very similar. It's just through headlines and um, rhetoric that people tend to go in different directions. And if you allow to l yourself to listen to people, you will often find um, some common ground very quickly. And I suppose a lot of our work has been trying to allow those conversations to, to start without the need for uh, as much listening as because we're all time limited. But normalization is, is important. And, and I think Brexit, certainly for me, demonstrated that um, really strongly when in Oxford, I mean, most of you here from Oxford, um, if you lived in Oxford and you talked to most people who lived in Oxford and you looked in most windows of Oxford, the idea that Brexit was going to happen was completely incomprehensible. If, however, you went to Wales or the South West, there it was quite obvious. So there's, there's a need for us to break out of our normal spaces and talk to people who we don't normally talk to, to understand people who we don't normally understand. But, and, and as I said at the beginning, I think the act of discussing climate change is an action in itself. It, it's often felt to me like I need to give someone an action to do, to sign a petition, to, to back this, to, to, to get involved in, in standard campaign actions. But actually having that conversation is quite a radical act with someone who doesn't agree with you to start off with and finding that commonality. And I think, you know, for many people, that's something the um, Obama ca campaign was quite good at and that, again, the Trump campaign revealed how even pollsters don't talk to people outside of the usual voting box. They didn't know it. Um, I got it right both times. <laughs> uh, no, but it was largely because if you, if you go to where people are at, you can hear different voices and different understanding. But people do need action to do. 
So your action, I would suggest going home from here, would be to carry on whichever campaigns you're doing, but also add in there an action of talking to people regularly, to talk to the person who delivers your food, or talk to the postman if it's raining a lot about this issue, talk to the person on, on the bus, make that normalization happen, give them action if they're interested. Had a very interesting conversation with a woman um, about um, climate change that was based on the fact that our train was running late and there was flooding in Bristol last week. It wasn't an easy conversation to start off with, but we got there. We had a fascinating conversation. She really liked what we were doing. If you're going to take anything home with you tonight, other than the book, I, I would suggest <laughs> that that would be an action um, for you to take home with you. I'd better leave it there because we're running out of time. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. I've got this one here. Um, thank you so much. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to everybody's question. Um, I'd just like to finish off this evening with, um, has anybody seen, anybody on social media in the room, has anybody seen something that looks like this before? Seen this? No? These are, um, did you say Twitter feed? Yes, thank you. Um, th uh, this is um, actually our annual fundraising appeal, and being a fundraiser, you might expect me to have something to say about that. So the first thing to say is to thank people. There's a lot of people in the room who have supported us financially, and um, we can't generate the insights that we generate uh, without support of individuals as well as trusts and foundations, and uh, some of the work that we do with organizations. So I'd like to ask you if you would um, consider it to um, support us financially, if you can, in this, our annual appeal week. Um, these uh, memes were made for, for us by um, uh, an intern. We have a lot of people coming, interns. We always have a communications intern, and they come from lots of different places, from um, Norway and uh, France and Belgium, and this was from a French intern. She, as a, her final project for the organization, she asked people that she knew, people who were studying with her at, at her university that she'd come across, um, what they thought about climate change. And I was just bowled over by a lot of the wisdom that was coming out of the mouths of young people. So that's what these are, and if you uh, subscribe to our Facebook page, if you're into that kind of thing, um, you'll see these there. I quite like this one. Rather than scaring everyone, let's look into what there is to win. And uh, this is Chloe, who um, herself was, she was the intern who did the program, the project for us. And uh, interestingly, she, she isn't a climate scientist. She's a student of translation studies. And uh, I think that her point about values is really valid. So thank you very much for coming and sharing with us this evening. Thank you for your great questions. Um, we'd like to invite you now to come and have a drink with us. If you have the time in the Crisis Cafe next door, you'll have been given a little token with a wine glass on it. Now's the time to exchange that for a glass of wine or something soft, if you prefer. And thank you so much. And uh, maybe you could join me in thanking Adam and Jamie for their presentations. <laughs>